here's what I wonder. When Mern Swift joined this church, I don't know how many decades ago, as a little girl in frilly socks and a short skirt, when her dad stood in this pulpit in robes like these, when she joined this church, did she make the same promises you new members will make? The ones on page four and five? Here's what I wonder, when Jack and Alice Allen joined this church decades ago, did they make these same promises when Ruth McMahon joined? When Menno joined? Did they say what we will say here? I assume it wasn't precisely the same words, but I do think it was just about the same promises. Whenever I meet with a class of new members, I say joining the church is not like joining a health club. It's not like joining AAA or AARP. You don't get benefits that other people don't get. At least when you join this church, there are no benefits you get that everyone, anyone who walks in the door couldn't get. You might have obligations that everyone else doesn't have when you join this church, but membership doesn't have any benefits that the rest of the world can't enjoy. What I say is that joining the church is like getting married. And it's like getting married in this day and age when half the world cohabitates. They live together without being married and nobody thinks much of it and it's okay. It's a good relationship or at least as good as any other and we all get along just fine. But those who cohabitate, who live together for a while before getting married and then get married always tell me that it's different after that moment. That standing up in front of a group of people and inviting God to hear promises, impossible promises being made, aspirational promises, promises you can't ever live up to fully, but that you're going to try to live up to as best you can, that there's something about that moment that changes you forever. And so, if Mern or Alice or Ruth, or Menno would hear, were here, I would ask them what difference it made to them. Those promises that they made or that someone made on their behalf, what difference did it make in their lives? I'm sure they would have an answer. I don't know what it would be. But one difference that I am sure that it has made is that they will not be soon forgotten. I don't know what other circles of friends and family they all had. I know some of them. I don't know all of them. But one thing we here will do for them and with them is be sure that they are not forgotten. We will rehearse their names before God. We will tell their stories to one another. We will keep them alive in this place. And that is what we are about to do now. The scripture says that we see now in a mirror dimly but then we will see face to face. It says that now we know only in part, but then we will know fully, even as we have been fully known. Here's the truth. We know only a portion of the stories of these beloved saints who have gone home to God since our last annual meeting Sunday, but what a portion we know. Listen now as we remember our own. Anne, will you come forward? Good morning. About 60 years ago, we were, lots of young people were joining this church. They were out of the service, starting jobs, and Syracuse was full of wonderful young couples. And in walked Alice and Jack Allen. I could stop right there. It was a moment to remember. Shortly after their first time here, it was time for new members to join the church. And Alice and Jack were among those that died. 
My husband and I had had a tradition of inviting all the young couple, anybody who had joined the church that evening, to come to our house for a little refreshments and getting to know each other. Thank goodness they came. I remember that night like it was yesterday. And that was the beginning of a long and enduring friendship with Alice and Jack. Alice loved the young people. And if there was a chance to be in the nursery or with the young, youngest ones, she was there. You could always count on her for that. We shared many, many good times together. They were neighbors right up the street. Our children were growing up at the same time. And it was very special. We'd have a couples club meeting. They'd be there. Alice would be in the kitchen, probably. And they entertained the young people, uh, the church, at some of the summer picnics. And I'm happy to say that Alice was able to make it through last May and June for the wedding shower and the wedding of their oldest grandson, Michael. And that was a day we'll never forget. Alice was in her glory, even with her oxygen. And I'm just grateful that many of you got to know her and love her as I did. And Alice, rest in peace. This is hard. We remember today Miriam Bruce Swift, Murney, dear friend, devoted member of this church for 84 of her nearly 98 years. She grew up here. She married here. She raised her four children here. And we celebrated her life here when she left us in July of 2014. So many words have already been spoken about this remarkable woman whose energy, skill, and compassion combined to serve Plymouth and the wider community. And thinking about her over the past several days, part of a poem came to mind. Now, I know that Emily Dickinson and Myrnie Swift were two very different personalities. But a verse of Emily's, for me, encapsulated the Myrnie I knew and loved. Who goes to dine must take her feast or find the banquet mean. The table is not set without till it is set within. Myrnie's table was set within, and whenever a need arose, it guided her to meet it. She served Plymouth on every one of its boards to say nothing of the many committees that benefited from her wisdom, whether it was to support Mary Lou Reeves in the development of the Plymouth Daycare Center, represent Plymouth in acts, participate in fundraising efforts, spe celebrate special anniversary gatherings. Myrnie was there with enthusiasm and good humor. When not so long ago, adults were asked to meet with church school children to talk about their lives and professions, Myrnie was there. When the choir was facing low membership once, Myrnie was there. Wherever there was a need for a casserole, a call, intervention with our criminal justice system on behalf of some of our church members, navigation within our health care system, Myrnie was there. Her table within set many tables without. One of the more remarkable things about this woman was her willingness, even her eagerness, to accept change. She sought out younger people and supported their desire to carve out new ways of think living, all the while holding to her own essential principles of justice and fairness. She could be very, very firm. 
one small example, can be recalled by those of us who sat near her during Sunday morning services. Myrnie would have absolutely nothing to do with the Holy Ghost, a term we don't use much and which she used never. When we did, Myrnie could be heard blasting out the Holy Spirit. That sound was a dramatic contrast to her folded hands and frown when clapping erupted during a service. She was a woman of conviction and drew a fine line between worship and entertainment, believing that one was an expression of faith that was trivialized by applause. It's impossible to acknowledge Myrnie today without mentioning Ed. Plymouth was so blessed by this amazing couple whose lives embodied the values we associate with our church. Take a moment now, each of you. Imagine Ed ringing that bell, trying to get us to go to the forum, and Myrnie telling him to not talk so much. Remember the diverse numbers of issues they brought here for our consideration. Offer your own private thanks to the love they showered here. We deeply mourn Myrnie's loss to us, but her spirit is alive in this place. I believe that. I hope of you, each of you believes that as well. And we remember her with love and great admiration. Ruth McMahon was a part of Plymouth for many years, but for uh, the last 40 or so of them, she was uh, living in another state far south of here. I didn't know her, and in fact, we didn't even get word that she had died until some months after uh, it had happened. And so um, I read from her obituary that appeared in the Syracuse papers. Ruth M. McMahon, 96, of Liverpool, passed away November 4th, 2014. She was a resident of Florida for 40 years before moving back to Syracuse two years ago. She spent summers in Fairhaven, New York for over 60 years. She survived by two nieces, many grandnieces, 10 great grandnieces and great grandnephews. Her sense of humor and her smile will be greatly missed. Some of you out there knew her personally. I encourage you to tell her story to one another and to those of us who don't know it in the time before us. And there's one more name, of course, not printed here that we should call out and remember in this moment, and that is our good brother, Menno. We will tell his story more fully at his service on Wednesday. But for now, we say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You new members who are joining today, this is what we promise you. We will not forget you. We will rehearse your names before God. You will be a part of us forever. And after you die, we will tell the story of you as best we know it. And we will light candles in our souls and in the world for who you are and what you gave us. We promise that we will never be apart. <laughs> 